morning, church. So we're going to be in Nehemiah today, if you want to turn there, Nehemiah chapter 2. Last week we talked about walls, and in a way we talked about them in a negative way, you know, like there's these walls that come up in our lives and we just don't know how to get beyond them. We don't know how to get through them, past them, but we realize that that God has this ability to put a, a door where there is a wall. He gives us the ability to go through them because of how amazing he is. Well, this week I want to talk about walls again, um, but I want to approach it in a little bit different way. And I want us to see that uh, there's, there's an aspect that walls are good for us as well. They're a, a positive thing. Walls, walls, walls. Um, you know, walls are everywhere. Our homes are full of them, right? They, they divide it up and, and provide different spaces for different things. Our countries have them. Well, sort of we do, right? <laughs> sort of we do. Uh, there are emotional walls that we put up, you know, and we decide if we want to protect our selves, you know, in some way emotionally. There's digital computer walls. We call them firewalls, right? Uh, so that we don't let certain people in uh, our area of our computer. We have social walls. We have social media walls. Um, and I just realized I found one just recently. There's this new app. It's called Clubhouse. I don't know if you've heard of it or if you've tried to get on it. I bet if you try to get on it, you're like, how come I can't get on it? Well, Clubhouse, is, it's a pretty neat uh, app, and I really wanted to get on it to be able to just connect with some pretty influential people and to learn from them. But uh, if you are a member of Clubhouse, you get two invites, and that's it. And so I don't know anybody that has them, and I can't figure out how to get on it. Maybe if you're on it, you can let me in. Um, but... Uh, it's, it's a, like, like there's this wall. It only lets certain people in. Uh, so they're even there on social media at times. That might sound a little mysterious, right? Which kind of leads to another wall, like information wall that we have sometimes, you know, for me to know and for you to find out kind of thing, right? Um, the Daily News, I was reading an article just this past week about walls, and the Daily News had this interesting article, and this is what it says. It says, the fact is, we are all being invaded by overwhelming forces, too much information, economic pressures, and deep fear of loss of statue and privileges. All of this can be projected onto the invading horde from the south. The wall offers symbolic protection, security at uh, securing our physical, social, and economic well-being. For others, the symbolic wall activates opposite emotion. It is experienced as the deepest violation of who we are as a people and of those who seek a better future in the U.S. It object, ob, obstructs our ability to embrace immigrants who bring vitality, energy, and renewal to our multicultural society. I bet that you have an opinion of that wall, <laughs> whatever it is, whether you are for or against. But today I want to talk to you about another wall, a wall that we haven't brought up yet, and that is that there's a thing that's it's called a spiritual wall. It's a and then the spiritual wall is really is in place around the church in order to protect the church. Um, the Bible talks about these spiritual walls. In Proverbs 25, verse 28, this is what it says. A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. That's interesting. A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. See, self-control is almost like a really important wall in our lives, right? I mean, it, it, it protects the inner person. And so whatever we talk about, I mean, we could talk about, what, food? 
If we don't have self-control, it could end up leading to something that is ungodly in a sense. We could talk about drinking. And, and if there's not self-control around us, this wall around us, we, we could end up leading us into something we don't want to be, a drunkard. Uh, if we talk about sex, God has wants this, to have a wall around us that's called self-control, right? And if we don't have it, we end up, you know, getting into things, uh, pornography or sex outside of marriage or all kinds of things that God never intended. And, and so th- that verse, when it says a man without self-control, it's so important to have self-control. The church needs self-control. Without the church having self-control, we put down our walls and and our walls are weak or our walls are in ruins, then who knows what could come in? The church needs walls. Walls serve several purposes. City walls offer protection from the enemy, right? Building walls provide a means of separating areas for different uses, just like our house. We have fences. You know, Jesus talked a lot about fences and sheep, you know, pens and how they're for the purpose of keeping the, the sheep in and only you can only come through the gate and he is the gate, right? But what does the enemy always try to do? He tries to go up over the fence, right? But if they come over the fence and sit through the gate, what does Jesus say? Be wary of that or them because they're, They are just of no good, right? But if you don't have a wall, then they easily could come in. You know, even Revelation 21 talks about a a new Jerusalem. And in Revelation 21, just in that chapter, and it talks about the new Jerusalem, the heaven, the place that God is preparing for us, it uses the word walls eight times. Even, even there, there's going to be walls. Why? To protect, to, to uh, hold in something good and keep something bad out. There's an understanding of completion when we talk about walls, you know, when you consider a wall. If you have a wall that is complete, then it offers complete protection. But if you have a wall that's only half done, then there's no protection. It just takes a little while longer, maybe, for the enemy to get around to that place. And then he just gets in. Today, I want us to look at Nehemiah because it is just, it is a book about walls, right? And Nehemiah, he was on a journey to go and uh, fix the wall around Jerusalem. Because the wall had become in ruins, it had become torn down with fire, and it made it extremely vulnerable, and he just had this desire. So let's just pick up here in Nehemiah chapter 1, and we're just going to read down verses 1 through 3. I encourage you later today maybe just to read through all of this, but but we're just going to be able to read through some of it. But Nehemiah 1, 1 through 3, it says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah, now it happened in the month of Cheslev, in the 20th year, as I was in Suda, the, the citadel, that Hannah, Hannah and I, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judea, Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, The remnant there in the providence who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. Really, my points are more like questions, okay? And so the first question I have as we look at Nehemiah, and he just learns from his brother that the walls of Jerusalem are in ruins, The first question I have is, what do you see? What do you see? Well, I see vulnerability. Don't you see that? Vulnerability that Jerusalem has. Vulnerability that Nehemiah has, if we read on. I see danger, you know. Danger from what? Those who would want to hurt, to destroy, to 
to take over God's people. Nehemiah heard that this sacred place was in ruins, right? Jerusalem. And it represented something really important to him. It represented a heritage, you know, like stories. This is where his, his relatives, his, his long-lost grandpas and grandmas and of old were laid. There was so much history there for Nehemiah. Even though he had probably never even been there, he just really had a desire to want to, it to be good. Uh, he wanted, you know, to not lose that heritage. It was a place of great spiritual importance to him and his people. And Nehemiah got word that Jerusalem was, the walls anyway, were in ruins, which made Jerusalem very vulnerable, right? I think the church is pretty vulnerable these days. Don't you? I mean, I, I, I can't help but read through this and not make a parallel to Jerusalem and the church, to the, the walls being weak and the walls around the church being weak. Our walls need some attention in the church. And I'm talking about the church as a whole, the things that I, I see. You know, the Bible talks about, and we've brought this up already, but the Bible talks so much about just certain behaviors that should not ever be what defines us as a church. There, there shouldn't be homosexuality among us. There shouldn't be adultery among us, idolatry among us. There shouldn't be debauchery or, or greed or envy. In fact, the Bible says about those particular topics and other topics like it, if you practice such things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then it goes on to say, those things used to define you, right? Those things used to be what you did practice. And the thing that we should underline in that passage of Scripture there in Corinthians is the fact that they used to be. We didn't bring them into the church. We left them outside of the church. When we decided to follow Jesus, we walked away from those kinds of behaviors. Because Jesus is the gate, right? And we don't get in and in, in his family besides through Christ. And you get, when you repent and are baptized into Jesus and you leave the old life, you get a new life. And we all know how this was, but it, or how this is. It's rampant in the world, right? All of those things I just listed off, they're just everywhere. You can't go out in the world and not, you know, see them, hear them, be affected by them in some way. You can't turn your TV on where they're just not there in every commercial, in every, you know, show. They're just there. It won't surprise us or shock us that the world behaves this way. But it shouldn't be in the church. But what I am afraid is that we have let our walls become so worn down that we have just allowed it to be. It almost as if we just accept it as normal. And it's not normal behavior. Now, I'm reminded of a story of, of a Russian. I'm going to say, call his name Ivan because I don't know how to pronounce his Russian name. But, but Ivan, he goes to this zoo in Moscow. And as he's going through this, this zoo, he actually has a guide that's kind of taking him along. He comes across something that just blows him away. It's, it's the lion's you know, den, the lion's uh, uh, exhibit there. And and right up against the lion is just a lamb that's just kind of walking around and right in that area. And he's just blown away. He's just like, I've never seen this before. How is it that this lion and this lamb occupy the same space? And, and his guides smiled and he says, that is peaceful coexistence. 
And he's just like, like confused a little bit. And his guide sees that confusion on his face. And he says, well, of course, we have to put a fresh lamb in every morning. <laughs> it's probably not too peaceful in there. Just peaceful at the moment, right? Moments of peace, but not, they aren't meant to coexist. I think we should quit thinking that there can be peaceful coexistence with good and evil, with, with Jesus and Satan. They weren't meant to coexist. And so therefore, for us to think that we should have this coexisting within the church of good and evil, of, of a list of things that God says shouldn't be in the church, and for us to think, well, no, they can. We can, we can coexist. You know, you know, maybe we think that we are just very, very, very different lambs than way back when our grandparents and great-grandparents went to church. We're stronger lambs. We're more knowledgeable lambs. We just, we got things. We can hang out with the lions. You know, the, the Bible doesn't, this is, this is what the Bible pictures when, when you hang out with the lions. This is a picture. Andrew, you can throw it up there. That's what it looks like. You know what? This is what 1 Peter 5, 8 tells us. He says, be sober-minded. Be sober-minded, church. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Not love up against, cozy up against, befriend, coexist with. Satan is out to devour but, but too often I think people think, well, we can survive. Daniel survived. You just got to have a little faith, Mike. You just got to put your faith in, in Jesus. He will protect us. And so we have this image in mind, don't we? See, Jesus will protect us. But don't be deceived, church. We weren't meant to coexist with Satan in his ways. He will destroy us. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says this, do not be deceived. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. It ruins the walls around. Wake up from your drunken slump slumper as is right, and do not go on, what? What does he say? Don't go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Now, back to the lion that's cozied up with the lamb, if you go back there, Andrew. That is an amazing image, and that is an image that God wants us to have, and that is an image of Jesus and us, right? We're the lambs. He is the Lion of Judah. But do you know where that comes from? It, it comes from Revelation 5, right? Jesus being the Lion who has defeated Satan. But that's, that's in the future, y'all. When the Lion and the Lamb cozy up together, that's in the future. That's not now. Now we're supposed to be afraid not afraid like uh, he can do anything to us, but afraid in it that he is seeking to devour us. And we are not supposed to cozy up to Satan or to welcome him into our existence here as a church. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, this is why Paul warns us, actually, more than warns, commands us. This is what he says. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. 
And oftentimes we think of marriage, you know, like uh, a believer and a non-believer dating and marrying. And absolutely that would be part of what he's saying here. But he's also broad and more broad than that. He's just talking about relationships, right, as a whole. For, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Bella? That's, that's another word for like Satan. Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What argument has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. And God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst. That's an important word, right? There should be this separation. Doesn't walls provide separation? Isn't that one of their purposes? To define areas? So go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will come to you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have, verse 1, chapter 7, since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. He's called us to, to purity in behavior and, and, and having an area that we protect, that we make sure the wall is up and it's in good, healthy order, and that it's keeping out what should be out and, and making sure what stays in is good. You tell me. Am I wrong in what I see? Remember, we're talking about walls, what Nehemiah saw, and what it causes us to see too. Do you see it? The weakened state around the wall, around the church that has caused compromise, that has caused, you know, just opportunities for Satan to come in and start creating problems. And I know some people will say, well, times change, Mike. You need to you need to be more modern. All I know is that I, I keep reading this ancient book and it doesn't change. It's it's still the same. It's the same words for thousands of years for Thousands of generations. It just keeps getting passed on and on and on, and it still stays the same thing. What, what he wanted them to know thousands of years ago is the same thing he wants us to know today, and he wants us to stay the same. The walls were supposed to stay. It, the Word hasn't come to ruin, but if we're not careful, the walls around the Word can Here's a second question for us as we look through Nehemiah. What do you do? So what do we see? I know what I see. What do you do? It isn't just Nehemiah that he saw something and he was affected by it. He, he felt compelled to do something about it, right? Right? And that's where we find him in verse 4. So Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4, it says, As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and, and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive to you your eyes and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I 
Now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the, the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commands and do them, though your outcasts are in the utmost part of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by the, the great power and by the strong hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and to give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man whom I was cupbearer to the king. Now I was cupbearer to the king. What do you do? What did he do? When he found out that the, the walls were in ruin, what did he do? I mean, he, he couldn't help himself but to weep for days, it says. And any time that you are emotionally distraught like that, you don't feel like eating it's not like a burden to fast in the midst of so much emotional wreckage. But he fasted. And, he, and it's not that hard to pray when you are in such a, an emotional, distraught place as Nehemiah. That's what you do. If something really bad happens to you, God forbid, the first thing that you're going to do is what? You're going you're gonna to pray and you're going to pray, and you're going to weep. I wish I weeped more for the church. I see. You know, I, I see the, the wall issues that we have. Why doesn't it affect us more, church? You know, I know that I have been pleading for quite some time, and maybe you're getting tired of my pleading. I don't know. But I just think that if we're going to build something that is of God, then the first thing we have to do is to try to get to a place where we weep for the church. That the church is this big of a burden to us, that we are this concerned for God's things and God's people, and that we're not, not just spending our time. I, I'm, I know that I can't help but bring in so much politics. But why do we weep for that and not weep for the church? Why is that such a burden to us that we can't hardly sleep at night because of what's going on in our little world? And yet we don't have the same type of burden for the church. And we say, well, we are. That's what we're, we're concerned for. And I hope that that's true. Which leads to another question, okay, that will help reveal some of that a little bit. And that is this. Not only what do we see, and not only what do we do, but what do other people see in us? What do they see? Because sometimes that gives us a clue on what we are really concerned for. Look at Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. I want you to see what others saw in Nehemiah. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Arxerxes, when wine was before him, I, put, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Remember, he was a, he's a cupbearer. This is what he did. Drank it a little bit and then gave it to the king, make sure it wasn't going to kill him. Nobody was trying to 
assassinate the king. That was his job. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, why is your face sad? See, you are, you're not sick. This is nothing but sadness of heart. Then I was very much afraid. And so there's this conversation that takes place if we continue to read. But what, is, what I want us to understand is that he said nothing. But the king saw his countenance. You know, he, he just saw as soon as Nehemiah came in, he could tell that this man had a, a very heavy burden upon him. What is wrong, Nehemiah? I just want to ask you, do, do, do the people who are closest to you, and you would have been pretty close to the king to be his cupbearer, right? He had to trust you. There had to be some kind of trust relationship that is there. And he knew right away. You know, I cannot, I cannot have a conversation with my mom when I am downtrodden, right? When I have a burden. Because as soon as I say something, I, I, just, I think I sound the same. How does she know this? I mean, it's a phone call. It's not even like she can see my face. But if I have something going on with my heart, you know, like a heavy burden, and I call my mom, hey, mom, First thing out of her mouth, what's wrong? Right? Have you ever experienced this? I was like, what? Nothing's wrong. But eventually, you know, it has to come out. Boy, if she sees me, as soon as she sees me, she knows. And that's because she's so in tune with her kids, right? The people in your life, in your circle, who are the most in tune with you, what is it that they see? What kind of continence do they see? What kind of glow do they see? Because they know you the best, right? What burdens do they see you carry in? The burden for the church? Or a burden for something else, somebody else, for yourself maybe? I don't know. I, I had a conversation with a, a really good friend, and, and so I'm going to be careful about sharing this, but because I could share this very thing in a, you know, about myself, and you'll probably see it about yourself, is what I'm thinking. And so I don't want you to think that I'm just, I could pick out anybody pretty much randomly, I think, and, and say what I'm about to say. But I had this conversation with a really good friend, and I just asked them, I said, so, so how's it been going? We haven't seen each other for a long time. You know, is this, this all this pandemic stuff and mask wearing stuff, has it really eliminated, eliminated, you know, your going and doing? And they said, no, it hasn't at all. And, and I'm wearing a mask, and... And this person's not, which is fine. I pretty much have tried to not wear it any more than I have to, to be honest. But, but they, they said, well, I probably have a bad attitude about this, but I just, I just don't do it. And then they went on to tell me two particular situations about when they went into a store uh, and, and it was required. And, and so when they went in, you know, they, the person saw that they didn't have one, and so they offered one to them, and they pull out their mask from their pocket and show, I got a mask, and then they just put it back in their pocket and walk on. And was, they were talking about this particular time where the person, you know, this was their job was to make sure everybody wore a mask because it was required for their store. Um, and so they went back up to him later and said, well, um, our store requires it. Would you mind just wearing it while you're in here? 
And they just had this attitude and just went on, just walked on. Um, and then there was another, you know, situation similar to that at another place. And in the same type of attitude, you know. And the thing that got me was wanting to tell the story, but before the story was even told, they, they led with, I know I have probably a bad attitude. Another thing that was told is, is in the midst of this conversation is, you know, if somebody tells me to do something, I'm pretty sure that I'm not going to do it. Um, and it just led to this thought. When we signed up to follow Jesus, symbolically, he like put a fence around us. Symbolically, it's like he put this, this uh, um, plaque around our neck, right? Kind of welcoming us, you know, to, to the family kind of thing. And, and we wear it with pride, and you know what it says? Follow me as I follow Jesus. Symbolically. But what if, what if it wasn't so symbolic? What if for a moment, just pretend for a moment, that that's what you wore? If you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you really wore one that says right across your chest, follow me as I follow Jesus. Would that not alter these little attitude situations that we have? I have them. You know, like if we went in public and, and we were fixing to, somebody asked us to do something and we just wanted to decide to just be rebellious and unkind and inconsiderate and you're not going to tell me what to do because instantly that's putting up a wall right having that like you're not going to tell me what to do but is that wall for Jesus or is that wall for me you know like am I protecting me or am I protecting Jesus am I being part of the church Part of the cause. Here's what Paul says about this attitude thing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, he says, So whether you eat or drink, right? So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Give no off offense to Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Now think about that just for a minute. Not only are we supposed to get along with each other in the church, but we're not supposed to be offensive anywhere we go. No matter what you do, whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, do for the glory of God. Don't be offensive to anybody in any situation. And listen to what he says. He says, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, I do not seek my own advantage. What? He's not seeking his own advantage? No. He's, he's inside God's wall, and he's just trying to make God look good and trying to please him. Why? Listen to what he says. Not seeking my own advantage, but that of many that they may be saved. I seek the advantage of others so that they may be saved. What, what kind of attitude is that? That's a crazy attitude, isn't it? And then this is how he ends it. Listen to this. This is where the old breastplate thing comes on, right? Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. We, symbolically, we literally should walk around with this big old plate that says, follow me as I follow Jesus. And it should make a difference in everything that we do, every encounter. We're not seeking our own. And so, you know what? That would make a difference. Back to my story, that would mean that I would just take the mask hate masks, I get it, 
I just put it on. Why? Because I got this plate thing that says right across here that says, imitate me as I'd imitate Jesus. And, and I'm just, I've got to do this. I've got to make him look good, even though I don't personally want to do this. Whose walls are the most, are we most concerned with? There's walls everywhere, aren't there? There are walls in the house. There are country walls, political walls, walls that I've created for myself. But whose walls are we concerned with? Nehemiah is concerned with God's walls. If we're concerned with ours, here's the attitude we have. Don't mess with me, or I'll show you how big my wall is. Right? Nehemiah could have protected his wall. In fact, it tells us, the Scripture tells us that he was afraid. He was afraid to let the king, when the king asked him, Nehemiah, what's wrong? you got this, like, heavy burden. He was afraid. Why would he be afraid? Because... If the king didn't like what he said, he could have just replaced him, had him killed. It was a very touchy, stressful job that he had, right? To not upset the king. And he was afraid. But he did. He did it. Because his wall of self-protection wasn't as great as his desire to protect what God, you know, what would bless God. And so he took a risk, protect Jerusalem wall, and put that first over my own protecting of myself. Those around you, whom do they see that you're trying to protect? Who are you trying to protect with your wall? You know, if you're living in sin, you, you are not protecting his wall. That's for sure, right? Here's the last question. So, what do you see? What do you do? What do other people see in you? And the last one is, how far are you willing to go? How far are you willing to go? Are you willing to leave here changed in some way just because you decide that you're not going to be stubborn and, and rebellious in nature, um, but I'm going to be yielded and I'm going I'm to wear this symbolic plaque that says imitate me as I imitate Jesus and I'm going to try to represent him the best I can? How far are you willing to go? Because I know what I'm, I'm, I'm like alluding to here is a challenge, a, a, a call to, to surrender a little here. I find it interesting, verse 11 of chapter 2. This is what it says. So I went to Jerusalem. And if you're not careful, that can just go right by you. How big of a statement is that right there? Do you know? Nehemiah was afraid to tell the king. The king gave him permission to be gone for a bit. And so he went to Jerusalem. Do you know that Jerusalem was 1,100 and some miles away from Persia? And so he went to Jerusalem. Did you know that he didn't own a car, didn't own a plane? Hopefully he had some pretty good sandals, right? And so he went to Jerusalem. You could just, you could just skip right over that and not even really understand the sacrifice that this man was, how far he was willing to go with this. It would have taken him, if he 
walked every day, six days a week, and rested on the Sabbath and didn't walk on the Sabbath, it would have taken him three to four months. I was listening to a, a podcast thing with a bunch of astronauts and uh, yesterday and, and some celebrities and stuff, they're having this conversation about going to Mars. And one of the astronauts says, well, it's, it's like take a, take a basketball and it's like the moon, right? And about uh, a few feet out, you take a tennis ball and it's, we'll just let that represent the earth. Mars, if you took a basketball and then you walked a mile past the earth and placed it down, that's where Mars is. That's how much drastic difference it is. He says it would take us with our ability with, you know, space travel right now, it'd take us about four months. It's just really hard for us to comprehend that, right? That's, how would that, how far would that take you to drive? How many years? Anyway, the point is, is that this was a big deal for Nehemiah to go to Jerusalem. And so I went to Jerusalem. And I just wanted to point out that because it was a, it was, he's talking about sacrifice there. He's talking about cost there. I read Tony Evans' a blog yesterday, and, and he tells the story of the chicken and the pig, and both were walking down the street, the, the chicken and the pig. And one, one day they came to a grocery store, and the sign in the window says, bacon and eggs desperately needed. And the chicken looks at the pig and says, I'll give them eggs. How about you give them bacon? And the pig stares back at the chicken and replies, uh, no way. And the chicken says, well, why not? He says, well, because for you it's a contribution, but for, to, for me it's a sacrifice. And I know that you heard that. I've heard that many times. But he goes on to say this. He says, unfortunately, today we have too many Christians who are only willing to give God an egg here and there. And after they do so, they think they've given enough. They wonder why God isn't showing up miraculously in their lives and really fulfilling their lives like they were hoping and desiring. And the reason he isn't is that God didn't ask him for a contribution. He asked him for a sacrifice. He asked him to put themselves upon the altar. You know, the Bible talks about in Romans chapter 12 being a living sacrifice. And I remember one of the preachers of old in my day always says, you know, the problem with a living sacrifice is they always want to crawl back off of that altar. You know, the king has asked each of us to live as a living sacrifice. Quite literally, that means dead to self, right? To dead to self, living for him. Romans chapter 6, verse 11, this is what it says. It says, So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments of, for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been bought, brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will not, will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. And we are to surrender to him. And the way that you surrender to the almighty God is by placing all of your priorities you know, under him by making sure that we keep this wall healthy that is around us, protecting us. That we make sure that we are be, being and continue to be a living sacrifice. Let's pray.
Father God, I don't know that this can accomplish anything. I do know that if it does accomplish anything, it is only because you give it power to accomplish it. And so, Father, I just want to take a moment here on behalf of us to just humble ourselves here to confess that we sometimes let down our guard and sometimes we weaken the the wall around the church and we allow bad things to come and they end up corrupting us our morals they end up pulling us away from you and for some of us they end up destroying the very thing that keeps us connected to you and God I just know that not only did the wall in Jerusalem need somebody like Nehemiah the walls around your church needs somebody like Nehemiah I just pray, Father, that you would give us a call, a a calling on our spirit, a a tugging, a a pulling for us to be concerned for the things that you're concerned for, to be concerned for your church. Give us, Lord, a, a passion, a conviction, a desire to rebuild, to restore um your mission, your purpose. That's our focus here this year. But don't let it just be just a, a theme or a, a series, but let it be something genuine, Father, for us. Help us to restore what's important to you and, and to glorify you in all that we do. Help us to represent you, not only in this little space, but represent you every moment that we are out and about. Maybe people see that we radiate Jesus and that if there's ever a wall that is put up, it's only a wall that would glorify you and help us be willing to sacrifice. Father, if anything is, comes of any of this, it is only because you work in us. And so, Father, pre, please help us. That's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.